You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense with your host, Doug Thorpe. Here's Doug. Hello again, everyone. This is Doug Thorpe, and you are listening to another episode of Leadership Powered by Common Sense. We're the show that tries to help you, if you are in a role of authority and responsibility, become a better leader. But hey, guess what? You don't have to have a job that calls for that. If uh, if you're running a household or part of a community group, uh, they just might need some leadership and you can step in that gap. And that's exactly what we're going to lean into today is the idea that I think it's a fair statement to say we are suffering a societal and a worldwide leadership gap. I think we see evidence of that in many different places, and my guest today is going to help us uh, peel that onion and take a look at some of those things. Her name is Bridget Holm. Uh, Bridget, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Doug. I'm super excited to talk about this topic, the problem and the solutions. So let's let's tee up a little bit of your background, just so folks understand where you might be coming from. Tell us a little bit about your journey and world experiences that got you into this space. (laughs) Well, it was actually during the reinvention evolution of 2020 when I was on my way to getting Zoom divorced then uh, moved out of my big, beautiful home. Virtual school happened for my three young boys. And I was in a new apartment, a new place. And then my job in the seniors industry disappeared. So what happened next? Well, these moments of contrast really do define our lives sometimes, wouldn't you say? For sure. For sure. And so that's, so what happened next was I had to develop some self-leadership skills and I launched Bridge to Freedom Coaching into the virtual Zoom world. And it had just been a side hustle at the time because I loved serving others with personal development growth and business strategies. And it took off with six clients within six weeks. And I I was on my way to helping leaders and industry movers and shakers and entrepreneurs to forge their own paths to serve other people with solutions in business and life. That's how fun. Well, I I know as you and I have talked, uh, we have spent a good bit of time talking about the idea of if someone is in a position of leadership, it all starts with leading yourself. So tell tell us more about your observation and, and theory about where that begins and what is necessary. Self-leadership begins with self-awareness. And then as we had talked about self-regulation, so you can get to self-direction. And then that highest level of self-actualization. That was a lot of words there, wasn't it? Uh, So let's talk about the first step. The first step is self-awareness. And most of us are living under the influence of circumstances, environments, situations. And we don't give ourselves that opportunity to say, hey, where am I at? What am I believing right now? Am I actually in a place that is making me happy or discontent? And is the is the environment the problem or is the problem me? So self-awareness is the first step to mastering self-leadership. And honestly, here, I want to just give a quick tip. You could do that right now. Just take a pen and paper out, set a two-minute timer, and do something I like to call the brain dump, where you're going to write your headspace out on paper. And then the powerful question you ask yourself after you're done writing for that two minutes is, what do I notice about myself? What do I notice about myself? Then next, we're going to go into self-awareness, self-regulation, which is emotional regulation. I know I shared my favorite quote with you by Aristotle. The mark of an educated mind is the ability to entertain a thought without accepting it. So then we go into emotional regulation because You want to be able to observe the world instead of absorbing it, right? Wouldn't you say? And in our culture today, it's it seems like it's very easy to absorb everything around you with everything screaming, follow this on Instagram, follow me on TikTok, right? What do you think, Doug? Well, and and I think also what we talked about when we were prepping here is the notion that there seems to be a pattern, and, and folks, I'm doing a very broad generalization here, but hang with me. The idea is that, uh, to your point, entertain a thought without 
necessarily accepting it. I think the key word there is entertain it. Enter, in other words, take it in, give it a fair audience. In today's world, we're galvanized. And if I don't like something you said, I immediately get kind of emotionally hostile about it and, and, and reject it without saying, hmm, is that a possibility? Is that an idea that I have not entertained before? Could that possibly have value and merit that I truly should consider? And yes, it could be an idea that's fundamentally 180 degrees opposite of how I might be pre-wired to think. But if, if I can't at least embrace those ideas and give them a, a fair audience and a, and a fair rendering before I judge it, um, I, I might be missing some great opportunity. I think you just highlighted a really key point. I don't want anyone to miss this. A way to start practicing and implementing this uh, self-regulation is by getting curious and asking yourself questions. So if you're in a place where you feel like everyone's saying anything to you and you're just saying things back, pause with a purpose and start asking yourself some questions because uh, self-leadership is about emotional intelligence. And when you're an emotionally intelligent individual, you could entertain those thoughts and ask yourself, is this true for me or about me? Or does this have to do with someone else? I can ask myself those questions before I feel like I need to engage with what that person is saying. And so that's a quick strategy that you can implement right now. Get curious, ask yourself some questions before you launch into a dialogue externally. Yeah, I love that word curious. And it's the, the hallmark message about being curious comes from the great cultural show, Ted Lasso and his, his famous pub scene playing darts with the, with the dark villain of the series. And um, he he does this whole soliloquy about growing up and how the people that hated him and and treated him badly, you know, lost the opportunity to be curious. And and he says to the villain, you know, Rupert, if if you were curious, you would have said, Ted, have you ever played darts before? And he said, Yes, since I was sixteen. And I, you know, and boom, he throws the bullseye and <laughs> beats the villain. You know. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> More people need to be like that. And uh, I, it, uh, for folks, if you haven't seen that clip, go over to YouTube and put in Ted Lasso darts and you'll get it. It's, uh, it's an amazing message to, to think about for this th idea of elevating your level of self-awareness. And it does start with curiosity, you know, and, and I also feel compelled to say, let's don't be let's not go over the edge with this or too far into self-criticism, but uh, be curious about what other possibilities you may not have yet considered <clears throat> when thinking about the leader you want to be or how you want to engage with other people around you. Correct. You have to fire and hire the right mental team to implement this appropriately. Because, and going back to that, it's like, Bridget, what do you mean by hire and fire the right mental team? It's fun. It's a fun thing to say, but what does that actually mean for me to implement this? It means you're typically in a relationship with your thoughts about people versus people themselves. And when we're entertaining these ideas and these conversations that may or may not have happened, we're in that relationship with our thoughts. And when we rent out space to those negative thoughts or emotions, well, they're expensive. And then we typically bring those into our real life conversations and people are like, whoa, what just happened? They're very caught off guard because you're in a relationship with your thoughts. So you want to address those first before you engage with another person in conversation. You know, that, that reminds me of a, a premise that I do share with all of my coaching clients there, uh, there is a school of thought that says when, when we go out into the world, we have a, a self-talk story that we tell ourselves, and that could be called our sense of identity, who we think we are. That's our identity. 
But the reality is, to your point, we go out in the world and we act and do, and how that impacts other people becomes our reputation. And if you're going to be an effective leader, you need to align that sense of identity with the actual reputation you build in your moment by moment interaction with the world. Yes. And I, and I think that becomes less of a focal point when leaders get burnt out, when, you know, when leaders are struggling to focus on time management and meeting goals and all right, let's make sure the teams are productive. And so I think that's easily you, they lose sight of that personal development aspect your business, your leadership life is who you're being when you're doing. And so you could be saying the right things and saying, do this, but if you're not being that leader, that's empowering, that's emotionally intelligent, then 90% of our communication is nonverbal. Right. So if you're wondering why uh, your team's not listening, you're, the, the retention is, is down, et cetera, you might ask yourself, well, Ask some people, how do you see me as a leader? What kind of leader do you think I am? If you really want to be bold, be open-minded and ask your team, what kind of leader do you see me as? Right. Because that's part of emotional intelligence. The emotional intelligent, self-aware leader is that person who could boldly ask the question, what kind of leader am I being right now in your right. life? Well, and I, I think this is where the natural segue into the ability to lead others kicks in, and that is if, if you do have that position of authority, you might own the business or you're a, a manager, executive in a, a bigger corporate type setting, creating that environment where people are willing to step forward and share an observation or share a, a feedback data point that can help you as a manager and you know it starts with opening the door and saying hey folks i'm not perfect i'm growing and here's how i generally operate as best i know it i'm you know here's how i had a guest recently who advocated he, he professes to have written an owner's manual of who he is as a boss and he shares that with his teams and once a year he makes it a point to update the owner's manual if if something has shifted and it, it it's i haven't seen it in print but it hearing him talk about it it's pretty elaborate i mean he starts with some personality assessment findings like enneagram or disc or <clears throat> myers-briggs so he reveals what his tendencies and leanings are and, and does his own narrative about those. And then he goes on to say, you know, in moments of crisis, here's likely how I'm going to show up, you know? And it, I, I challenged him, I said, yeah, but isn't that a little off-putting? Isn't that kind of a potentially taken as a my way or the highway sort of, you know, message he said, I, I got that at first and I had to adjust the way I presented it. I had to make it <clears throat> more, well, more about curiosity, just to, where people didn't guess how the boss was going to react. He said, here's my roadmap. I'll share it with you. Well, yeah. He's like, this is me on a good day. This is me on a bad day. So you can easily identify what's going on. Right. <laughs> Brilliant. Right. You know, he should have all his employees write a leadership manual for themselves. If he had an outline, that would probably be pretty marketable and a great idea for most employees and teams. Yeah. Uh, maybe I should chat with him. But the other component, the definition of leadership, um, as far as I've seen, the best way to describe it is a leader is being worthy of being followed. I agree. So... It's just because it's so easy to look at the complicated things like a leader is this, a leader is that. It's all about the doing of what a leader does. But the simple statement is a leader is someone who's worthy of being followed. And if you ask yourself as a leader, am I worthy of being followed? Then you're in the right place to start to level up your leadership game. Right. That's a very good point. And I, and I think that is a question that many struggle with. And um, I, I know I've kind of through my own, what now, 16 years of doing executive coaching and advising, 
I, I I saw a pattern emerge in what I've done for my clients over the last several years is we've started our engagements by asking them to articulate back to your point of let's get it on paper. You know, can you define the leader you want to be? And you, you may not be there right now, but if there's if, if you know there's an element or an aspect of your influence over the people around you, what is it? Uh, what do you want to claim? Name and claim, you know, and 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 put it down. And then let's spend our time in the coaching setting talking about which ones of those are you already good at or pretty strong at and which ones need work and, and need to be improved upon. And then let's begin that process of self-actualization toward that end goal. Oh, fantastic. I love that. Yes. It's like, okay, here's who you want to be as a leader, but who are you being right now? Exactly. hundred percent. I love that. I'm curious, actually, uh, what would you see in all your years of of coaching leaders and, and those in authority? What are the top two problems that you see time and time again that they struggle with? Typically, I think people, when they start in the earlier chapters of their career and they get put into a, a management role, which is... It, it, it should be synonymous with leadership, but it's not always. What they suffer is an evolution of prior experience. They, they think about bosses they used to have, the good and the bad and the ugly, and, and then they try to weave some kind of their own patchwork quilt. But here's the basic rub that I believe is big in modern business. One is that for those who start out in the corporate journey, they, they go to work at a company, they're inevitably hired as a sole contributor, mm -hmm. independent individual contributor to a team. They do their work, they work real hard, they learn, they grow and they build. And all of a sudden one day they're recognized as the best member of that team. So when the supervisory job comes open, poof, they're the new manager. And that, choice by the business has nothing to do with potential for leadership or even for management for that matter. But they get in this grind of, okay, let's see, subconsciously they're saying, well, I got recognized because I worked real hard and I produced the biggest numbers or the most quality or whatever. And now they say, well, I'll just double down on that and I'll, I'll find other success. And guess what? That's usually the way it happens. Yes, you do. And you, now you get that second promotion. You're in a higher level. And that that thought process becomes ingrained. And you're just doing it on a broader, wider scale. And pretty soon that leads to burnout at a minimum if they're not truly entertaining the ideas of what it means to be a leader, you know, learn how to develop other people, learn how to delegate, learn how to manage from a more strategic level, not a transactional level. Ah, I, I love, I love everything that you just said, because the truth is being a manager and a leader, they are different and we're, we're, but at the fundamental level of what the expectation is for managers is leadership. Right expected to lead. You know, I find that um, with leaders and, and in my own personal experience, when I've led teams, I've found that when I'm able to focus in on who they're being, when they're doing, they do doing better. And when you can give them that ability to self-direct instead of just blasting out orders or statements or saying, hey, this is, this is what you need to be doing and help them to define their role based on what needs to get done, it gives them the ability, the opportunity to take authority over their own position, regardless of what that position is. Right. Because people, employees and team members, if they don't claim authority over their role, then they don't feel a sense of ownership, which leads to a sense of purpose in the workplace for them. Right. No matter what they're doing. And so giving them that ability to critically think to say, okay, what needs to be done next? If your team can start to function like that, then as a leader, 
Your job is to ask more questions than give orders and give statements. Instead of getting them to critically think is a, a powerful skill set to give your employees and your team members. And right. then also checking in with them. Right. That connection needs to happen as well. Yeah, it, it is so very important. And once we do this work that I do with my clients, when we try to define this leader they want to be, I often get asked the question, well, how do I really achieve that? And I'll say, well, it's actually pretty simple. It can be as simple as a daily exercise at the end of the day, five minutes. Mm -hmm. Take a walk down your calendar for the day, the meetings you had, and grade yourself. In, in that moment, did I show up as this person I say I want to be, yes or no? Or to what degree? If, you, if you're a numbers guy, you want to put it on a scale, fine, do that. But just do that quick assessment and look at your day and say, yeah, I think I'm getting there. I, I generally, in most of my moments today, I, I hit the mark. I, I did what I wanted to do. Or, no, I, no, that lunch meeting was awful. I, I went way off the rails. I, I didn't, I, I lost it. You know, I, I, I just wasn't even close. And, and again, don't beat yourself up over it, but use it as curious learning to say, is there anything about that moment that triggered me and caused me to go off in another direction? Hmm, should I be thinking about that? Because you know what? I'm going to be working with that person for a long time, and maybe it's, it is me that got triggered and I went off in a bad direction. So how do I want to do that next time differently? Yes. And also drawing in the human component to business because everybody has lives. If you're going to ask your team or your staff, um, all right, what do we need to do to get this done? What, what is our next goal? What is the, the end date for this project? Did you ask them what's going well in their life? Mm -hmm. Did you ask them what's going well in your world? Or did you completely disregard the fact that they're human beings and they are in the process of becoming human doings. Human doings don't do well because they tell themselves that they're worth nothing if they're not doing well. And it's typically, if it's a toxic leadership environment, then they're never doing well enough because they can't meet the expectations going forward. And that leads to those situations of quiet quitting, of uh, lack of employee retention and ineffective communication all around. So honoring your team and employees with the simple question when you meet with them or when you have a team meeting, hey, what's going well? Or how about we do a two minute brain dump to get started here? And that increases the overall feelings of, oh, all right, I feel affirmed in who I'm being. Therefore, they do doing better. Right. And what, what I want to add, and I, I like that train of thought, what I want to add to it as a leader, you, you still can set standards and expectations about what you need your team to do. But I think a lot of what you're saying is that as the leader, you need to be sensitive to everybody comes to work in a slightly different state every day. And it, 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 I use the Maslow's hierarchy as the basis for that, and, and that is that there may be days when they are way low on the Maslow's hierarchy because they just had a horrible fight with their spouse or a significant other. They walked out the door upset. They came to work. They're fuming, still thinking about what should have been, and their their brain and brain scientists tell us this you the, all the blood has left the frontal lobes and it's back in the f fight or flight so you can't even think uh, your your cognitive uh, logic is unplugged literally in, in your brain and the boss is saying hey where's the what's the status of this project they're going uh, uh what project you know and and that's not a should not be a knock against the individual. That's when the good boss would say, gee, Bridget, you don't seem yourself this morning. Anything going on you want to talk about? And, you know, and depending on what that relationship may be, you know, they may be real honest and say, I just had a horrible moment at home and <clears throat> I got to get myself collected. I know I need to get to work. 
and you know, well, why don't you go down to the break room, get a beverage and shake it off and do what you can. If you need any help, I'm here. Let me know. And, you know, that's all good. Yes. And, and another way to do that, I have, I have teams that I'm working with right now, instead of having that potentially off the rails conversation, which could disrupt the work environment and productivity, right? Even though I think that's phenomenal to have that conversation. If you make the time to do that, I'm sure it will pay off. If you give them the ability to get self-aware for themselves in a two minute brain dump, then they are able to unload on the paper, look at themselves and decide who they want to be in that moment. So it's a very quick and efficient skill set. I actually have my kids do this um, and all of the people I work with. And I just did one this morning. <laughs> so it's it's really invaluable tool that takes two minutes that gives someone the opportunity to unload all those things that are happening in their lives when they come to work, because work is the majority of our time. You know, if we're if we're human doings for the majority of our life, we're never going to feel that purpose and that worth. So you always want to be honoring who you're being and what you're doing so you can do it well. And that's one of those strategies that can absolutely help too. I, I like that idea. And I, I do totally agree with the idea of putting it out on paper. And I've done this with my kids as well when they've kind of run into and begun a, a serious uh, decisioning process about life choices and things, put it on paper, you know, and I, for the decisioning part, I, I do the classic two column T chart, you know, just what are the pros and what are the cons and all those ideas that have been rattling around in your brain for days, weeks, or months, perhaps, uh, you know, get it on paper and give it a weight and, you know, give it a, a measure of whatever significance it should or shouldn't have in the moment. And then look at your grand total of your chart maybe it's leaning one way or the other maybe the answer is yes maybe the answer is no but stop allowing those thoughts to keep swirling around on the merry-go-round in your mind and you know put them out there and and make that choice 100 percent. and I, I think the number one problem in um, our corporate culture today is that we're not encouraging employees and leaders to help employees to cultivate that self-awareness to leads to self-direction and self-regulation in the workplace. I think that that is part of the solution to solve these cultural problems that we're having in the workplace uh, when it comes to trying to, people are trying to define themselves constantly by something. And if they can look at their best skill set and say, this is who I'm being, am I in that state of, I want to be this person today? It, it gets rid of a whole slew of problems that we're experiencing in our culture in terms of communication, in terms of communicating who people are, their identity, et cetera. And it just helps us to create a, a uh, what's it called? Uh, almost a, a culture of connectivity where people are constantly saying, I know who you are. All right, you're in your best skill set right now. Let me encourage you in them. Right. You know, I, I, I can hear voices in the audience right now going, oh, come on, guys, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, you know, um, I can't build that kind of environment at my job for these 10 reasons. And either consciously or subconsciously, I think one of the biggest deterrents to having that true open dialogue at work is ultimately how you end up rating and ranking people on your team at the end of the year. You, you know, the classic annual review, oh my God, you know, everybody hates them, nobody likes them, but yet they perpetuate and they've, at least in the big corporate setting, they've, they've been perpetuated because of regulation and litigation over fairness and proper distribution of wealth, etc. But you know, in, in a company that's kind of gone overboard in the way they do that rating and ranking, that alone may drive people's willingness and openness to be real and be honest and be straightforward that, you know, hey, Bridget, I'm having a lousy day today. I don't, you know, maybe I should just take the day off. Is that okay? And uh, because that employee is thinking, man, that's going to hit my rating come year end. I know it will. So I just need to suck it up and figure it out. But again, you're likely still not in the moment to do your best work. And there is such a thing as the empathetic leadership. 
There absolutely is. But at the same time, you know, what I love about our culture is we're constantly being movers and shakers. And so I want to challenge that idea of feelings aren't our friends all the time. And, and if we are constantly in a state of like, I, I think I need this, um, as an employer or a leader, I would say, can I challenge this for you for a moment when it comes to that? And, and same with the, the 10 reasons why, you know, this utopian idea of leadership sounds great, right, Doug? It sounds amazing. Yeah. But we have a long way to go from where we're at right now. So take with it what you like from our time together and leave the rest. But really, you want to meet people where they're at. Meet people where they're at. And that phrase, can I challenge this for you for a moment instead of can I challenge you on this, is it's a high deservability phrase. I talk about the law of deservability in my book, Stuck on Ready, because people are constantly in a place of justifying, rationalizing, and settling against their authentic selves, but also against what they're capable of doing and how they're capable of serving and helping. And, and so having, um, if, if you're as a leader right now, you're selling yourself 10 things on why this won't work, challenge that for yourself and say, write down those 10 things on paper, why what we're talking about would not work for you. Then ask yourself, is it true? Is it true or is it not true? Because there's always mm -hmm. a yes answer in those. Yeah, I like that. Well, Bridget, this time has flown by and we are about up on time here, I think, for this episode. So thank you so much for everything you've shared. Tell folks the best way to get a hold of you. The best way to get a hold of me for direction or strategy is BridgetHom.me, or you can go to my website, BridgetToFreedomCoaching.com. But you can find me on any social media platform. If you need to, some suggestions, strategies, or you'd like some help in your leadership or um, team building abilities, give me a shout. And we will have all those links in our show notes, everyone, so that you can uh, hop down, uh, just mash the link there, and you'll get right to that information. So one last time, Bridget, thanks so much for sharing. It's been a pleasure. It's been awesome, Doug. Well, with that, folks, we're going to wrap this up, say goodbye. I do like to remind you, we have a video version of this show over on YouTube, channel by the same name, Leadership Powered by Common Sense. Hop over there, check out the archives, and leave us a comment or drop me a note for feedback and ideas on future topics you'd like to hear on this show, uh, or maybe you're interested in being a guest yourself. Happy to entertain that idea. So go out there, make it a great day. You've been listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense, hosted by Doug Thorpe. If you would like to know more about the coaching and advisory services he provides, visit DougThorpe.com.